Welcome back, everybody. I am Samantha with the NBLD Project. You've seen my face on all of the Facebook Lives so far, and we are back this week for another Facebook Live. Um, if you've been with us, you know that we do these about once a month. We bring on different professionals or people diagnosed with NBLD or parents, or last time I think we had some ambassadors join us. So this week we have another special guest with us, and this is Josh Doyle and he works for the Goldberg Center, which I, I believe is based in Boston. And um, they also have offices here in New York City. Sorry, I think we're maybe having some trouble. I'm gonna switch over to Facebook right now and see. It looks like we're live, so we're gonna keep going. Got a couple people on with us right now. Um, anyway, sorry, this is Josh Doyle. He works for the Goldberg Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Like I said, they also have offices in New York City and do work with people all around the world, um, not just Boston and New York based. Thank you, Zoom and technology for that ability. Um, Josh has been an educational consultant and special educator for I believe over 25 years mainly works on educational placement for parents with children with complex learning and behavioral needs. So he works on helping parents and families find placements for their students in schools to help best fit their needs, um, specifically with children with learning differences in NBLD. So he's been working with NBLD, NBLD for a while and knows what it's about and what's going on and what those students are looking for and needing in their in their schools that they're in. Like I said, he works all over the world. So if you are watching from somewhere outside of the Northeast, no fears. We um, or he is able to help outside of this area as well. I know that we have a lot of people here in New York that we can refer to, um, but luckily he can work elsewhere. So anyway, I'm going to transfer this over to him so that he can say hi and introduce himself. He's going to be doing a presentation on PowerPoint today. So it's a little different than our normal setup. So you're actually going to see some slides with some information. Um, and as always, you can ask questions in the comments, leave anything you want to talk about at the end in those comments, and we'll address those at the end. All right, I'm going to Thank switch you. it over to you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for that. Was very nice view. Um, let me do the screen share. All right, can you see it? It's all good. Let's see. Give it one second. I can see it on my end. Facebook's a little lagged behind, so we'll see if it clicks over in just a minute. Awesome, we are good to go. I'm gonna mute myself and you are ready. Okay, um, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just a little bit of background. So most of my experience prior to being an educational consultant was working in boarding schools, boarding and day schools, specifically for students with complex learning presentations, uh, many of which uh, were NVLD. I, first heard of NBLD, I think back in 95. And since then I've worked with uh, literally thousands of uh, you know, adolescents and adults, um, helping them with you know, school placements. I was a classroom teacher, ran dormitories. So yeah, I've been with these endearing people for quite some time. Um, the, the objective today uh, that I wanted just to cover is uh, you know, helping your child, uh, your helping your family, really, um, when it comes to making the big decisions um, and understanding the process of what it means when your child has to transition to some type of setting after high school, most notably college. Um, it provokes more anxiety uh, than it should. Uh, it's overwhelming. I was, uh, I'm making a sweeping generalization here and I hope I don't offend anyone, but, um, I was an admissions director for 10 years at a boarding school for kids, uh, most of whom were NBLD. And I would have to say that of no fault of their own, uh, with no ill intent, um, parents whose children are NLD tend to be some of the most anxious out there for good reason. You know, you are the ones that have had to protect your children. And so, you know, in a lot of cases, they're called, you know, let me just 
they're called helicopter parents. And here is, you know, I would argue that NBLD parents, so to speak, are the original helicopters, not because of entitlement, not because of wanting to live vicariously through their children as most helicopter parents want to, but because they need to, because their children often feel unsafe. They're the antithesis of this type of helicopter parent, the one that wants their child to go to a top-notch college for their status. That's not the case with a lot of parents with NBLD. They just are simply trying to make sure that their children are functional. Um, and then of course, they're not these either where they're trying to, the snowplow parents are trying to eradicate any hardship that their child may feel. Um, one of the, there was a, a family that I was working with a long time ago. Um, and this dad is a Wall Street guy. And there was a really big discussion on what their hopes and dreams were for their child with a nonverbal learning disability. And, you know, we were talking about what was needed for this child to be successful. And he was coming to this conclusion that most of their uh, hopes were not backed up by data. And by that, I mean that when you're going to be sending your child, especially a child with a nonverbal learning disability to some type of setting like college, it's really important to, you know, long before they leave to do this sort of gut check, if you will. You know, what is my child going to need moving forward? What are they like on their worst day? And the reason I put this Wall Street guy down is he said something to the effect of that when you make an investment, when you make a big decision, you make it off of data points, not necessarily entirely on hope. And if you're hoping your child is going to just find a way through, you need to do a serious gut check and set them up for success. And that can be a very, very painful process. It can be feeling as a parent myself and as a, you know, having a son this year as a freshman in college, it's been a complicated year for everyone, but it's, you really do have to take a serious look in terms of, you know, what am I setting myself child up? What is my child setting themselves up for? What are we helping them? Are we being complicit in setting themselves up for too much risk? Um, I always Can I say- Can pause you real quick? Sure. Can you go on your PowerPoint and click on the view tab? and then switch it to the presentation view. Yeah, how would I so do that? So that it's like the full screen. So up in the top, like in the middle, it says view. Um, Keep going up a little, right next to help, underneath the word transition. I'm sorry, I- No, 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 you're good. You're you're really close, so- um, Yeah, I can't see it because that other thing is there, so- Oh, gotcha. I'm sorry. I, I can't see it. So no, you're good. I'm trying to think of where else you can go to it. Actually, down at the bottom, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you, where it says comments, yep. there's a fourth option over from that before the slider. Can you hold right there, it over the slideshow? Yeah, try that. There we go. Now it's full okay. screen, a little easier to read. Sorry about that. Okay. Great. Oh, good. I can just still do. Okay. So, yeah, let me get down here. all right. I did it. Okay. And I don't know if I frankly can remember, I just mentioned this. Um, always keep in mind, uh, and this is something as a consultant that I often think of when parents come to me and say to me, you know, we need your help finding a school or whether it's a, a high school, whether it's a college, what have you. One of the questions I'll often ask is tell me what your child is like on their worst day. And I'm not talking about behavior, I'm talking about, you know, when are they the most fragile? When are they having the most difficulty? And the, what I have to do is I have to think, you know, very clearly in terms of, okay, now I have a data point. Now I need to make sure that the, that I'm giving the recommendations that are appropriate, meaning that I need to find a school or a program that will be able to work with that child on their worst day without it being um, overreaching. You know, it's, it's far better to, you know, have your child be able to go to a school that is going to be able to handle them during their weakest moments. So there doesn't have to be this Herculean effort to get them back on track. So 
this is something that um, I often have to have. These are the comments that I often hear, not necessarily by the parents, but by the students. And these comments that you hopefully can see in front of you um, are things that I've heard on a daily basis for the past 20 plus years. Um, and I'm making a sweeping generalization here, but um, for a lot of the students that go that have learning differences, um, getting out of high school is an opportunity uh, that provides hope. It's an opportunity of them being able to start over that perhaps high school, school itself has not been necessarily the most pleasant experience for them. And so by going to college and starting over, pressing restart, they are hopeful that they'll just be able to you know, not carry baggage with them, that all of a sudden when they turn 18, life will become easier because they're now legally adults and they have more autonomy. And so what often happens is, is that they will not make a full conscious effort to take advantage of what they have around them at the particular time when they're 15 or 16 or 17. Those are the building blocks as to what can make or break a successful transition to college in terms of you know, what skill sets do the students need when they go to college to have learning issues. I would argue that a lot of it is, is that they walk in um, with a sense of at times um, they're in denial. They're in denial of the importance of doing things such as having organizational skills, um, blaming other people for their issues, um, not doing their homework. They may not necessarily see an immediate need to do their homework, but they don't understand that it creates a sense of discipline. Um, so when a lot of these kids go to college, if they continue to ask these questions or argue with these questions throughout high school, they're really setting themselves up for failure down the road. You can't say, I'll get organized when I have to. You have to be very organized when you go to college. You have to realize um, that when you go to college, that you are going to have to take classes that you do not like. If you're going for a bachelor's degree in something or even associate's degree in something, you're gonna be required to take classes that you have no interest in. And that's just part of life. And you have to find a way to get through those classes. There are many ways to do that, but you know, again, um, if the kids are gonna be successful, they have to tackle these questions before they move on to a college setting. Um, here are some other things that often can set kids up for going down the wrong track. A lot of students, again, this is a sweeping generalization. A lot of students that have you know, NVLD or dyslexia or what have you, ADHD, um, they will say, again, as I said in the previous slide, I want a fresh start. Um, I want to be able to have an experience like everyone else has when they go to college, you know, because on social media, they look so happy. Um, by the way, on a side note, this past college year has been without question, unequivocally, one of the most misleading college experiences, I would argue, uh, in, in this world's history. What I mean by that is, is that there have been so many unhappy children in college this year because of COVID. And everyone is convinced that everyone else is happy and they themselves are the only miserable people on the planet because social media has created this ridiculous facade that things are wonderful. Uh, I can assure you that no one is really having much fun in college and social media can create more depression, anxiety, et cetera, when kids look at that as being the ideal. So that's been happening for years, but this year, unbelievably so. So side note, sorry. Okay, uh, one of the things that you kids will often say when they go to college is, I don't wanna be part of a program. I don't wanna get special help. I don't wanna get assistance. I just want to go in and take as it comes. Um, that is a recipe for disaster. I don't know why I put this imagined one on there, but just uh, maybe it's because it's a New York thing, forgive me. But um, biggest mistakes, again, making decisions on hope, um, this is one thing that I really think is very, very important. Um, for many children, uh, young adults, what have you, you can 
to a certain degree, utilize the idea of tough love. You can say, well, you know, if they're going to go and screw off in college, maybe that will help them grow up a little bit and then they'll learn. What happens typically with children who have NBLD or just learning issues as a whole, uh, sometimes you, these children, these young adults don't have the luxury of picking themselves up from failure. Oftentimes that they lack the resilience needed to survive, not literally survive, but to emotionally sustain a failed college experience. And if a child with a learning issue goes to college and is not prepared and ends up having to drop out, the chances of them falling into a major depressive episode are exponentially higher than for students that don't have learning differences. So what I guess I'm getting at here is, is that we can't just assume that these kids are going to learn from their mistakes because this, they, the consequences can be so significant they may fall into such a depressive state that it's going to be very, very hard for them to pick themselves up because they don't have the life experiences to that require the resilience to move forward. Um, another thing um, is that a lot of and a lot of people come to me with this. A lot of people whose children have learning issues will say, "Well, listen, high school's been incredibly stressful for them. Now that high school's over and they're going to college." Maybe they don't need to be on, you know, psychopharmacology anymore. Maybe they don't need to be on antidepressant medication or stimulant medication. Maybe, you know, the situation has changed as such that meds are no longer needed. I would argue that the worst time to um, taper kids off of meds is right before they transition into college. That would be that is the worst time to do it. It is incredibly risky. It's incredibly important that uh, your child see their medical provider at least two to three times before they go to college, maybe during the summer, to make sure that medically speaking, that they're safe, that their meds are working to the best that they can. Um, I've just seen so many kids who will decide that they don't want to be on meds anymore and they'll decide not to take them. And that leads to a major depressive episode, which could lead to catastrophic failure. Um, the other piece, and I'll jump into this in a second, is that we'll jump in once we see our child struggling. Um, as parents, we want to help our kids. We don't want to rescue. But it's really important to be proactive in terms of doing everything we can to help our children to make sure that we jump in before they struggle. Um, Here's some other things that are just absolutely mind boggling to me that happens all the time. A lot of students, a lot of parents don't want to tell the college that their student is going to that the child has a learning issue or needs accommodations. Um, there's no shame in that. Um, I, I am dyslexic. I'm profoundly dyslexic. I flunked out of high school. I went to a boarding school for adolescents with dyslexia. Um, I had to zealously advocate 30 years ago when I was in college to get extended time on my tests. If I can do it, okay, other people can do it too. Um, you need to let people know at the college that the child has a learning issue. That is something that needs to be brought to their attention right after you make a commitment that you want your child to go to school. Sending their accommodations two weeks before school starts, it's not responsible. It needs to be done right away. Your child, if they can get extension on tests and so forth or some type of accommodation, that should happen long before uh, they start school or that should be put in place long before they start school. Um, and I, I just, I'll read this out. Uh, learning differences are, uh, do not define you, who you are. Not disclosing them will have irreparable consequence College professors, and this is meant to the parents, college professors are not going to take your calls. So for the parents out there who have been able to at least maybe call an advisor, call you know a teacher, call someone, college professors will not take your call. I know that because my father was a college professor. <laughs> they will not take your calls. You're on your own. 
The other piece is, is that when your kid goes to college, uh, make sure they're only taking three to four classes a semester, especially the first semester. Uh, if you can, do three. Um, and also, forgive me, I flunked anatomy and physiology twice when I was an undergrad. Um, big mistake. I should never have taken it, but I took it my first semester, first year of college. I should never have done that. Anatomy and physiology is a really, really hard class. I put that in because it's the type of class that a lot of science majors fail the first time around. If your child has a learning issue, if they need to take anatomy and physiology, for goodness sake, make them take it over the summer, any time other than during the regular school year. And the other piece too is you need to follow the advice of an advisor or someone who is current in their understanding of learning issues. Uh, talking to a tenured college professor, a college professor who's been teaching the same classes and is a dinosaur, they're not going to understand your kid. Um, okay, here's the other thing that I'm a really big stickler about. Um, it's just in terms of understanding the fragility, um, I'm 50 years old. If I go through a major depressive episode, if something should happen in my life, like I lose my job, my spouse gets sick, one of my children is struggling. Um, I have because, not because I'm special, but because of my life experience that a lot of people my age have is, is that I can plow through. I can somehow you know, channel my resiliency and get through setbacks. Kids that are 18 and 19 years old, they don't have that reservoir especially kids with learning issues because they're using all the resources just to get through the day. And it's important to remember that if a kid goes to college and if they end up having to leave after the first semester or the first year, there's a very good chance that it's gonna throw them into a major depressive episode. And they may not necessarily be available you know, emotionally to do much. If I suffer a major depressive episode, there's a good chance that maybe for like four or five months of my life, I'm not as available, but I'll get through it. I'll be okay, but I'm 50. I'm not gonna change much in six months. There's not a lot that I'm gonna miss developmentally. For a child that's 17 or 18, 19, three to four or five months, that's like three to four years for someone our, my age. Okay, so again, I just can't stress enough to you as to how important it is that we set our kids up for success, because if they do have a setback, it's going to have more consequence than it would be for most people. All right, how I spent my summer vacation. We see this all the time. That's how they spent their summer vacation, staring at a screen. Please, I beg of you, don't let that happen. Um, this is something that I think I wish more people would do. Um, what do kids with NVLD have the most difficulty in? Transition. Uh, going away for the first time to college is overwhelming for all kids, but especially NVLD kids. If there is some type of program that's academically driven, but also has, you know, has a lot of fun to it, or some type of college preparatory summer program uh, where they leave home for like between four to six weeks, um, to do it maybe the summer between junior and senior year, that can give these kids such a boost of confidence that when they go away from home, when they leave home and go to college, they have experience to draw from. I've just seen so many kids who have said to me over and over again, I'm so glad that I did something the summer before my senior year, because it really gave me the confidence to go away the following year. Um, and in terms of if they say something to you like, well, you know, I need my summers, I need a break. Listen, I, a break from what? So they can sit in front of a screen and do nothing, please. It's, it's absurd to think that they need a break. They need to stay active. Um, and then also just, you know, real quickly, summer should be looked upon as an assessment for what is to come for both parents and students. Um, if your child goes away between their summer and senior year, uh, junior and senior year, it really gives you data points to see what, what were the pitfalls, what worked, what didn't. You know, how, you know, what are some of the things that your children need to work on for them to be successful next year? And what are some of the things that you as parents need to work on to support your kids? Um, I've never apologized more to my son, who's 19, a freshman in college, because I 
you know, I tried as I as support, I tried to be as supportive as I can to him, but there are, sometimes I've micromanaged. Sometimes I tried to be supportive and it came out wrong. I wish I'd had a summer to screw up <laughs> so I could make his life easier. We're all in this together in some type of way. Um, also, when you're looking at colleges, um, if you're leaving the entire process and your child's limping along during the college searching program, you need to take a serious reality check and realize whether or not that this, your child needs to take the lead on it. They need support, they may need some handholding, but you cannot carry them through. Um, just some real quick stuff. Um, I'm of a firm believer that uh, if your child is vulnerable, finding a school that's within a three hour radius is a good idea. That's just how I feel. Um, it sometimes they need to come home for the weekend and just to just be, you know, it, it helps a great deal if they're closer to home, not necessarily 45 minutes away, but two to three hours is ideal because you don't want to be able to like see them all the time. That'll do no good. Um, keeping light, keeping a light course load the first semester. Um, one big thing that really helps out is, is that I'm, um, I, if anyone wants to contact me at any point, I work with a ton of people who do executive functioning, coaching, academic coaching, specifically for college students, and they do it remotely. Um, there are so many students I work with who have NBLD or dyslexia, where I set them up with a few of, uh, of my colleagues who are executive function coaches, and they have two to three meetings a week with this person on Zoom, and they start meeting them before the semester begins. They map out their entire semester in terms of when do we start this paper, when do we start studying for the test, coming up with a wellness plan. The college or university is not going to help you to that extent. And sometimes you have to use an outside resource. It has improved so much over the years because of uh, technology. But there's so many kids that I have worked with, if they can do this for the first semester of the first year, it helps enormously, just helps enormously. Um, and then as I said before, summer classes for really, really difficult, cla for difficult classes like anatomy and physiology. Um, and if there's a student summer orientation uh, for the school, go to the first one because it gives you time to process all summer long. And also you can usually get the best dorm rooms that way. Uh, worst things you can do, <laughs> don't take a year off. There's no such thing as taking a year off. You have to do something. Uh, smaller colleges, uh, programs, let's see, colleges, okay. Here, I'm not saying this is the list. I'm not saying this is the definitive list. <clears throat> All of these are programs and colleges that I've worked with several times over the past several years that a lot of students that I've worked with with NBLD have gone to and done very well in, some better than others. This is not the definitive list, but this is a variety of different programs out there that can be very, very effective for some kids. So if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. And what is the most important skill? Advocating for yourself, not, not teaching your children to let you advocate for them. Um, when I say ordering their own meals, what I mean by that is, I meant it more as a metaphor, is that don't order your child's meals at a restaurant. Let them figure it out on their own. One of the things that drives my daughter crazy, who's 14, is when I bring her to the doctor's office, she has to go in by herself. And this is pre-COVID, okay? Again, this sounds trivial, but it's a very big deal, teaching your children to do things by themselves. The other thing that will drive admissions counselors crazy in colleges, and it's, again, it's a big metaphor, um, don't say we apply. When you apply to college, don't, as the parents say, well, if we apply, no, the child's applying. You as a parent are not applying. And Costco, this is sort of a ridiculous thing, and I'll own this, but um, <laughs> there was a student I worked with with a nonverbal learning disability who wanted to learn how to cook and I was running a dormitory. He didn't know how to fry an egg. So what did I do? I brought him to Costco. I bought a big thing of eggs. We went through three dozen eggs before he finally learned how to cook the perfect sunny side up egg actually was over easy. 
I'm talking about repetition, repetition, repetition. The skills that I've talked about, you have to teach your children over and over and over again. Remember that children with NLD can learn just about anything. It only takes them about seven to eight times longer to learn it than most people, but they can learn, okay? You just gotta keep at it. And I think the last slide I have is, um, oh, maybe that's it. Hmm. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, big deal, teach them how to do their laundry now, not the weekend before they go away to college. Now, I don't care if your kid's 11, make them do their own laundry, okay? <laughs> So I'll leave it on that note. Thank That's you for awesome. listening. Okay, so I actually have a couple of questions. How do I get back to? Will you unshare your screen now, Josh? Sure. Do I just put, click the green? Maybe. Stop share. Yeah, that. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, I actually was taking notes during a lot of that. So I have a couple of follow up questions and comments that I would like to ask kind of before we get into Do we have any comments on the Facebook? You writing them down for me. Okay. All right. So I have a couple questions that I want to go back to one. I think the laundry thing is really funny because I think we've talked I think in like two or three of the different Facebook lives we've done so far, we've talked about summer activities and things to do with your children in summer, and then even just how to prepare them for adulthood and life after living in their house. And, and laundry is one of the things we've talked about before. So I definitely think that that's really good. Um, and I, I can't remember which Facebook live it was, but we talked about just teaching those life skills in the summer sessions and like still continuing it on as like an educational type of summer situation, but there are things as far as life skills and those just essential things that you need to know um, that are good to, to do. I wanted to ask a question. The Life Development Institute, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly from our LDA conference, is this the group that kind of sets up like, they're only at certain colleges, but they, What's, do you know which one I'm talking about where they are set up as like an apartment complex where they're helping you, but then you're attending classes at the college? Yeah, well, there's the Life Development Institute that I was talking about. You might be speaking, you might be thinking of the college living experience, which has locations around CLE. the CLE, yeah. yeah. CLE. And okay. they do fantastic work for a certain population. The okay. um, Life Development Institute is li located in Glendale, Arizona, outside of Phoenix, and it is a program specifically for kids with uh, complex learning presentations. And, you know, a lot of the students that go there, um, most of them live in apartments that are, you know, near the main office, and many of them have their own individual schedules where they go into the school and learn life skills, you know, whether it's, right. you know, managing money, learning how to cook, what have you. But a lot of them are concurrently taking classes at local colleges and universities, typically, um, you know, typically as non-matriculated students. And, and I don't know if this will be helpful, but one of the things that I really, really think is exciting um, about what's developed in the last several years for uh, individuals with learning issues when it pertains to colleges, if you look at some of the models that are out there, the models that are proving to be very successful for a lot of students with, you know, NBLD is to not necessarily send them to a quote unquote LD college. Not, you know, not, it doesn't necessarily have to be college specifically for kids with learning issues. However, there are a number of programs that are opening up where the program, and just an example uh, is Mansfield Hall. And they have three locations around the country, uh, Oregon, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, I mean, and uh, Vermont, and what they do, the one in Burlington, Vermont, um, it's located right in downtown Burlington, Vermont. And the students that go to Mansfield Hall have to be non-matriculated students at the, either the University of Vermont or Champlain College. And they go to the college, you know, probably three or four classes a semester. And while they're there, they have tutors at Mansfield Hall that are teaching them how to go to college, helping them with study skills, time management, life skills. Uh, providing uh, residential 
facilities so the kids can develop friendships, et cetera, that they have, they can find their tribe. Because one of the things that's so difficult for kids with NBLD is, is that they have difficulty finding their tribe in college. And there's ways to do that, but they have to get through their anxiety first. So I don't know if that helps, if that answers your question. That was sort of, a, sort of went off on a tangent there. No, but. you're good. I, I remember CLE after you said that, because they were at the LDA conferences and just, I thought it was an interesting concept. And this sounds like the man, you said it's Mansfield College, the one you were just Mansfield talking about, Hall. right? Mansfield Hall. Or Mansfield Hall, yeah. Okay. So okay. The, so the problem is, is that sometimes for NBLD kids, going to a model where they can go and take classes at a prestigious, you know, college or university while getting support from an outside service and having residential support, that eases the transition enormously, as opposed to just going to a dormitory with a thousand other students and, and winging it. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, and then do you have, I'm trying to think of what I want to ask next. Do you have any examples of summer camps that you would recommend? I mean, we've, we've I, Camp Aquila, I think is one of the ones that we've spoken with in the past. And I know there's SOAR. Um, do you have any other call well, or summer camps that are good? Yeah, SOAR, SOAR is a fantastic program, but that's really more adventure-based. I think yeah. that you know, some examples could be is that um, even, you know, um, I would recommend looking at resources such as Mansfield Hall. I would recommend looking at places like College Excel um, or the Brem School um, mm -hmm. or the Eagle Hill School. Even Landmark College has a summer program that's specifically geared towards students that are going to be seniors in high school and to essentially help pave the way for them to feel that, you know, set them up for the transition if you will, the following year. Yeah, I think we actually had an ambassador that may have done that summer program through mm -hmm. Landmark, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, and then I know you talked about summer camp between junior and senior year, and mm -hmm. you just talked a little bit at the end of the presentation about the summer before the freshman year of college, as far as like teaching them laundry and making sure they stay busy and not taking that year off. What other skills or things would you teach and or work on with your student before they go off on their own for that first year away from home? Well, I you know that that's, I, your a question is very well received and it's appropriate, but I would, the only thing I would add to it is, is that you shouldn't be waiting until, you know, the summer before you, <laughs> before you teach them these skills. These, you know, these are the types of things that respectfully that one should be teaching their children the summer before their freshman year of high school. Okay. Well, these, these are things, you know, again, as I said before, kids with NVLD can learn just about anything, but it takes them seven to eight times longer to learn it. Okay. Gotcha. And so, you know, um, you know, teaching them, insisting that they do their own laundry, uh, learning how to um, manage money can be Herculean, but it's important to do. Um, the importance of organization. The, the, and the one thing that I think that is more helpful than anything, it's, it's, you know, if the opportunity presents itself and it's safe, then having a child with a nonverbal learning disability get a job is so important. Something that, we're, it's something that will take them out of their comfort zone. Something, you know, working at a grocery store. Yeah, my, my son is, uh, my son doesn't have uh, a learning issue. But he, and he's had all types of jobs in his young life, but he said that the most meaningful job in terms of what taught him the most about life was working in a grocery store. Everyone goes to grocery stores. You see all different walks of life and it forced him to come out of his shell and interact with people. It taught him about the integrity of work. So um, finding a job, that's really important, even if it isn't something they're interested in. In fact, I would argue that teenagers should not be allowed to have a job that they're interested in. It teaches them resilience. That's funny. Um, okay, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions. I have a feeling that some of the ones that came in on Facebook may align with some of mine. So I'll come back to mine if they don't. So I had one person that is curious as to how you got in this field. Oh, how did I get in this field? Yeah. Um, do I am required to? And I'm joking. I don't you don't to. have to answer. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's an easy thing. Um, it came down, it was an opportunity. I worked at a boarding school for kids with nonverbal learning disabilities and dyslexia. And um, I had wanted to do something different in my life because I'd been working 80 hours, 90 hours a week, living and working in boarding schools. Um, yeah. 
And I was approached by the Goldberg Center. They knew me because uh, they would place a lot of students at the schools that I worked in. So they approached me about a job. And um, when I took the job, I assumed wrongly that I would be working primarily with the types of students that I was enrolling into boarding schools. What I found was is that most of the kids that I was working with were the students that I had rejected from being enrolled into the boarding schools. Most of the students that I you know, have been working with for the past 13 years are students that their learning issues are so significant, they've gotten virtually no assistance throughout their lives and their therapeutic needs are so acute that going to a traditional boarding school or college is out of the question and they need therapeutic intervention. The most rewarding part of my job though is just that after meeting those kids and helping them out therapeutically when they become in the latter part of adolescence or young adults, I get to have these types of conversations with them in terms of let's, you can go to college, it's gonna be a lot of work. You need to practice, continue to practice a lot of humility and not be in denial, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, meaning that life's not just gonna you know, hand you a silver platter. Um, so to answer your question, I was approached. I had no desire, no ambition to be <laughs> consultant it just kind of landed on me and it, it, it's worked for now yeah cool um so i'm gonna come back to that question i think okay so someone is asking if you have a similar presentation for NVLD people who are post-college and living on their own, have a job, but are still having trouble meeting people in socialization. So this presentation was really geared towards that transition from high school to college. Mm -hmm. But as we talked about before we went live on Facebook, I think a lot of these points and a lot of these uh, things that you've discussed today can be applied to other transitions in life. Um, and I had kind of written a question about that down as well, but um, I, my biggest question is the transition into the workplace. In college, you're saying you recommend telling the professors and alerting everyone about the learning disability and how they can better work with you. Do you have the same advice going into a workplace or do you have advice on that? Um, I have advice on, well, that's a good question. So I'm gonna, I, I can only, do I have thoughts on it? Yes, from my own experience, um, it can be, uh, that's a real tough one because in a lot of cases, when you go into a school <laughs> setting, you're entitled to help. You're entitled yeah. to receive assistance. It's your right as a student to receive assistance. The same can't be said for outside of college, outside of school. Um, have I disclosed to employers what my learning issues are? Yes, I have. But I didn't disclose my struggles until I was well established. Out of not out of shame, not of embarrassment. I'm not embarrassed to be dyslexic. Um, I feel shame when I make a mistake. I feel shame when things get triggered. So I guess the this may not be a very popular answer. I'm sure that someone, some people would disagree with me on this and they're entitled to do so. But when it comes to disclosing uh, a learning issue, a lot of people are not very well informed of what that means. Uh, if I tell someone that I'm dyslexic, they presume that I'm, that I'm illiterate. And so I have to be very careful about how I disclose it and to what degree. Um, if you do end up disclosing it, uh, if one can be self-depreciating in a humorous way, that's the best way to disclose it. No? Okay. So I don't know if that helps, but that's my No, experience. we get, everyone has a different opinion on it. And we always, yeah. even articles online, like everyone is like, do it or don't. So there's no, obviously there's no right or wrong answer. It's just kind of based on your background and the presentation you've already given us, like what would your suggestion be? So that's my, really good. My suggestion is, is that you not disclose it at first. My suggestion is, is as you know, as an, as we, you, try, you need to try to understand the culture of the working environment and as to how the receptive they'll be to it yeah. you know it's appropriate to advocate for yourself but you also need to a certain degree keep that's your private life that is that, that it's your issue it's nothing to be ashamed of but you're also not 
required to disclose that you have diabetes. You're not required yeah. to disclose that you um, uh, survived cancer. Yeah. It's a private decision. Well, and I think too, if possible, and if the company is big enough to do the research on the company culture, like you're saying, to really is, understand the company point. itself. That's a wonderful point. Absolutely. Because yeah. there's, I mean, Glassdoor, if for larger companies has a lot of information, I'm sure there's other websites out there, but I definitely think if the company is large enough that there might be some research that could go into that as well, as far as disclosing that. Um, I'm, I just, I'll make this one quick, one last point. No, about it. Um, one of the things, unfortunately, is, is that I was actually at times reluctant to disclose my learning issue to some of my colleagues in programs specific to helping individuals with learning issues. Um, I wasn't ashamed, but I actually, I found prejudice in those environments and the environments that should be the most accepting, the most accommodating, yeah. were actually the most, you know, prejudiced towards me. And I found that um, I had to prove myself to be a competent employee to not necessarily demand accommodations. And if I didn't prove myself first, they would assume that I would have difficulties with things. And, and in a lot of cases, I would get snide comments by some of the leaders in the field. Well, Josh, you know, you are dyslexic. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. Like, um, okay, so this is a good question. And we actually, um, it's not a, a topic that we talk about often, um, but this kind of leads into how, I'm trying to like not trigger anything. I'll ask the question directly as it was on Facebook. So how often do you see kids with NBLD develop severe anxiety and depression? Or do you have an answer to that in your field? Well, I would have to say, I guess it's a good question and I'm glad they asked it. So what I'll say to you is, is that, you know, depression, anxiety is relative. I will say, however, that um, of, you know, being in the mental health profession and working with kids throughout the past 27 years with all different types of learning, you know, struggles, I would have to say without question unequivocally that children with nonverbal learning disabilities are the most anxious kids I've ever worked with. Period. Yeah. Period. So do I see these children developing high levels of anxiety? Yes. Do I see them developing, uh, you know, significant depression if left untreated? Yes. It's almost, uh, you know, it, it's almost a silly question in my field that if there's a child that has a nonverbal learning disability, if you ask the parent, oh, does, does, if so do they have a history of anxiety? It's, it's almost a ridiculous question. So I don't know if that's a fair answer, but um, they are the most anxious kids. And I typically find the parents are the most anxious parents as well. Yeah, gotcha. And of, um, of no fault of their own, of no fault yeah. of their own. Yeah, and I will leave that question at that just because there's a whole other topic that that could go into that we aren't gonna talk about. Um, so I have another question that I was thinking of too. Do you have any advice for parents if they are getting pushback from their students? One, about the about going to college at the beginning of freshman year or when they've maybe survived their first semester and they've decided they don't like it and they don't think that it's for them. Do you have advice for parents that are getting that pushback or are seeing that kind of situation where the student within VLD isn't sure that college is the right path? Um, again, case by case basis, but I also think too that, you know, oftentimes that is anxiety talking. That is, that's fear. You know, it's, you know, again, these children take a lot longer to acclimate. So, you know, if we were to say to every young adult, especially this past year during COVID, if I had a nickel for every kid that called me and said, I want to come home after the first week of college, the colleges would be empty. They'd be ghost towns. So I guess what I'm getting at here is, is that, you know, my recommendation is, is that, you know, be reasonable, you know, your child, make sure that they're safe, make sure that there's, you know, that they're able to get through, but don't let them throw in the towel so quickly, because again, these are the most anxious kids out there, but time and time again, while NLD kids are often the most, you know, vulnerable and anxious, 
I would argue that also some of them are the most resilient that I've ever met. They yeah. truly are. So I guess what I'm saying is that don't throw the towel in, but I, I, I really strongly feel that um, if a family is thoughtful and proactive and does a lot of planning, the chances of that NBLD child wanting to come home after the first semester goes down if there's proper supports put in before they arrive on campus. Oftentimes, when a child wants to drop out, not all the time, but a lot of the times it's because they've gotten overwhelmed or they don't know how to dig themselves out. Okay, gotcha. And then I think this is the last question that I have. Again, if we miss something, we'll go back in the comments and maybe answer, provide resources if we have them available. And I, we get this question a lot too. Um, do you know if there's any resources available? Oh, this one's, is this written correctly? What resources are available for young adults to help them overcome severe executive Okay, so directly from Facebook, what resources are available for young adults to help them overcome severe executive dysfunction? Do you know of any resources? We get this a lot. So we have a lot of adults um, that watch our live videos and, and for the most part, a lot of stuff that's talked about is geared towards younger people. And so our adult population is really looking for resources and help um, mm -hmm. on different things that aren't necessarily like education based. So do you know of any resources available for young adults to help them with these? Uh, one person, one person that I hold in the highest regard, uh, her name is Carol Frankenberger. Carol Frankenberger okay. is based out of Connecticut and she runs a program called CogMed. And if you Google her, she just, she started a new business recently, but she specifically works on executive functioning for students with, and adults with learning issues. Um, okay. She's the immediate past head of school at the Greenwood School in Putney, Vermont, which is a school for kids with learning issues. Uh, Carol is a very well-known and reputable national figure on, you know, um, you know, for individuals with learning issues. I first met her uh, over 20 years ago when she was doing a presentation on, um, you know, helping, setting your child up for a college environment that they have a nonverbal learning disability through the Maple Leaf Clinic. So I would say that two really good resources, Carol Frankenberger and Dr. Dean Mooney from the Maple Leaf Clinic in Vermont. Okay. And we'll try to link to some of those in the comment section later. Um, if we, once we find the websites, we'll connect to those. Also, I, I would recommend yeah. someone like Dr. Mooney who runs a Maple Leaf Clinic, uh, he does a ton of parent coaching for parents who have children with nonverbal learning disabilities. Okay. Specific That's to great. that. Good. I'm just glancing through the notes that were passed to me one more time. I think that's all I have. Do we have any other questions that have come in? No, okay. So I think we've answered almost everything that was in the Facebook comments. There's a couple that were a little bit um, Something we would want to answer maybe more in a private setting or an email. If so, if we didn't get to one of your questions, maybe reach out to us by email at info at nbld.org. We may be able to send you some resources to help with some of that information as well. I am going to link your website, which I assume is just the Goldberg Center, right? To it's, the uh, comments. It's, it's, yeah, it's edconsult.org. E D. Okay. Like my email. My email is josh at edconsult.org and our Websites. Okay. So I'll connect that for anybody that wants to glance around the website, see what they offer, see if it's something that you uh, would need or would be interested in. Um, this Facebook Live will be housed on Facebook as a video, so you can always come back to it to view that presentation and, and listen to it. We'll also upload it to our YouTube page so you can see it there. And if there are no more questions and no more comments, I would just like to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have different perspectives on different topics and just have um, you know, different ideas and resources that we can provide to people out there who are looking for them. And so we think that these videos are 
are really helpful and give everyone a chance to kind of ask questions as they need them. If we have any questions that we can't answer, we may send some over to you by email if you don't mind. I'd be delighted. Um, taking a glance at those. So thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And to everyone out there watching, we will be back next month. Have not decided who we're going to be talking to, but we will be back next month for another Facebook Live. Uh, if you have suggestions, you can always email us at info at nvld.org. We do our best to try and get answers to anything that comes our way. If we can't, then we try to find a professional that can help. Thanks for signing in today. Thank you.